Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment round him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. I want to share from the thought, make the U-turn. Have you ever been in a situation where you've been in a car and your friends are shouting at you, make the U-turn? Well, I used to live in Kenya and when I lived in Kenya, we went on a bunch of different drives with some friends. And one of the jobs I had where I was, was I was a teacher and I had responsibility over a bunch of children. And one of the drives was really nerve wracking because we were going through a game reserve and we came to this area where there were lions and the driver of the bus simply said, I think I need to make a U-turn. Sometimes in life, we have to make U-turns. We have to go back before we go forward again. I wonder whether you've ever made a U-turn in life. Maybe a U-turn on a decision you've made, a job, a U-turn on a pair of shoes, or maybe a U-turn on a relationship, a U-turn on a certain way of parenting, a U-turn on a discipline or a habit that you had picked up. In this passage, we read of Peter who is making some U-turns. So what we see in this uh, passage before this, Peter has disowned Jesus and he feels like a complete failure. So he goes back to what he knew before he followed Jesus, which is what I've found happens a lot in our lives. When we hold on to the reins of our past, we're led to our defaults. 
And we tend to go back to where we felt most comfortable before, even though it's not our calling. And in fact, sometimes after our greatest regrets, we go back to some of the things we were about before Jesus entered our lives. We can so easily fall back into old patterns and ways of life. And so Peter goes back to fishing. And notice in the passage, it's not just Peter. He's taken the disciples with him. They're going with him. Peter has influence. Just like you and I can have influence when we're not following Jesus just as much as when we are. Now, of course, there's nothing inherently wrong with fishing unless you've seen Sea Spiracy, which is a great documentary. And if you have, you'll know what I mean. But fishing for Peter represents life before Jesus. It represents actually life without Jesus. And for Peter, it represents an old identity. So Peter's gone back to this old profession because he thinks he can't be a disciple anymore. He's failed. Maybe you felt like that. Oh, I can't be in that group anymore. I can't even show my face in church anymore. And that's how I felt at university. I didn't think I could show my face in church anymore because of the guilt and shame that I was carrying, the hurt that I'd caused other people. I was ashamed and so I focused on anything that wasn't church. And so in the same way Peter did, went back to my nets, went to things that took me away from Jesus. And so Peter returns to the familiar to try and forget the past. He goes back to the thing he's comfortable with. And he has this first night back on the water and they catch nothing. It sounds familiar, doesn't it? A hard night's work ends with nothing. Peter's failed as a disciple. He's failed at fishing and he must have felt a failure. And then Jesus arrives on the scene. He's on the shore. A voice calls out to them saying, friends, have you caught any fish? Throw your net on the other side and you will find some. Peter's thinking, I've heard this before. In fact, it was his last fishing trip he took, which was just over three years ago, just before he supposed to drop his nets for good. This time there's no talking back, no questions. He picks up the nets and tosses them the other side and they bring in a huge haul of fish, 153 large fish. Peter's just been out fishing for the first time in three years. Can you imagine? Can you imagine it? The haul of this fish and all these fish. And John says, it's the Lord, Peter. And that's all Peter needed to know. The new old Peter is back. Irrational, erratic, spontaneous. Peter jumps into the water and gets to shore. Peter's dirty, he's fishy, his hands are raw. And he's about to have a chat with Jesus, the man he disowned, his leader, his friend. He's got a lump in his throat. He's about to have this conversation. I wonder if you've ever had a moment like that where you know that you're going to have a tough conversation where probably there's going to be some consequences for your actions. It's been eating away at him. Now, Peter, he didn't know what his future held. He might have thought he was going to get suspended, cut out of the discipleship team altogether. And all the disciples are watching. And Jesus knew the only way Peter could move into the future was to be set free from his past. And so Peter has to face the shadows of his past. And Jesus literally sets this up in the most remarkable way, over a meal and a fire of burning coals. Namely, by the way, my favourite meal of the day, breakfast, cooked breakfast, well, in this case, fish and bread. We don't know what kind of fish and we don't know what kind of bread, but we do know what kind of fire. And this is important because it's a fire of burning coals. And the only other place that we hear of burning coals, the only other place it's mentioned in the Bible, which is as a charcoal fire, the only other place it's mentioned in Scripture is the place where Peter denied Jesus three times. Jesus made a specific kind of fire so that in that moment Peter could breathe in and smell the burning coals and be taken back to that moment. Jesus wanted to set Peter free and redeem that smell forever. Jesus wanted to take him back to the moment of his greatest regret and failure. Not to guilt him, not to shame him, but to say, Peter, you don't have to pretend anymore. You're not a fisherman. You're a follower of mine. And ultimately, Jesus frees him. 
He wants to set him free from his past. That's what happened to me after university. I no longer needed to pretend I was someone else. I had my own charcoal fire moment with Jesus. So Jesus creates this scene so that Peter has to get honest with himself and honest with God. Can we see it? You see, Jesus is taking Peter back to go forward. Jesus is giving Peter the chance for a U-turn. And I believe that's what he wants to do with some of us today, whenever you're watching this. And the questions begin to come to Peter, do you love me? Now listen, I'm not a fan of being asked the same question more than once, definitely not twice, let alone three times. He asks him three questions, which were all the same questions. He says, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my lambs. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Take care of my sheep. Do you love me? Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep. So Peter denied Jesus three times. And Jesus asks three times, Peter, do you love me? like a catapult stretched to capacity and then released and the object set free, propelled to advance. On the other side of these questions, Jesus is going to offer Peter a word of hope. But first, it's as if Jesus knows the only way Peter can go forward and ultimately become the rock which the church is to be built on. The identity that Jesus gave him in the very first place when he was introduced by his brother Andrew three years prior to this moment. The only way that was going to be possible was he had to come to an understanding that Jesus wasn't cross, he wasn't angry, but that Jesus had something much more in mind for Peter. More than fishing, more than boats, more than nets and massive catches. Which we see in response to Peter's third, I love you, Jesus simply says, take care of my sheep. And he tells him how he's going to die and follow me. To understand the full weight of the sheep and lamb talk, we have to know that back in John 10, Jesus described himself as the good shepherd. A shepherd who looks after and lays down his life for the sheep. And in spite of Peter's lapses, it's as if Jesus is saying, Peter, I believe in you. And do you know, Jesus believes in you. You could replace Peter's name with your own. John, Jesus believes in you. Peter, Jesus believes in you. Angus, Jesus believes in you. Helena, Jesus believes in you. What's most compelling to me about this passage isn't Peter's confession of his love for Jesus or his miraculous catch of fish, which is incredible. What encourages me most, and I hope does for each of us today, is Jesus' belief in Peter. Belief is powerful. I had an old rugby coach and my first game ever playing rugby, I was 12 years old, I had a top hanging off me, I used to be a lot smaller than this, and I played fullback and I had instilled in me that I could tackle anyone and the bigger they were, the harder they fell and tackling became a huge part of my game because someone believed in me so much. When someone believes in you, it makes a huge difference and when you believe they believe in you, it makes even more of a difference. It's even more the case with Jesus. Peter left him high and dry, couldn't even admit that he was one of his friends when he was arrested and killed. And he claimed that he would go to death with Jesus and he failed to even admit he was with Jesus. For us, it's easy to deny Jesus. It's easy to deny the truth that we're his followers, that we're Christians. Easy to go with the crowd. Easy to say when someone asks you the question, what did you do on Sunday? Oh, not much. Just watch Netflix. Hey, I've been there. I remember being at a wedding in Italy with my wife once and I was asked the question what I did for my job. The simple answer was I was a student pastor, but I gave this elaborate answer which involved a combination of pastoral um, counselling and event management for the university. Luckily, there's grace. There was grace for Peter and there's grace for you and for me again today. Maybe this year has been one of the toughest years of your life and there have been a lot more downs than ups. There's grace for you. Those decisions you've made, there's grace for you. For some today, Jesus is saying, start again. 
For others, he's saying, I have a new role for you as a guide, as a spiritual parent for others. Others, he's saying, that group of people that you're not the best version of yourself with, I believe that if you were, you could see incredible transformation in that group of friends. God's created you to be in that environment. It doesn't make sense, but Jesus believes in Peter. It doesn't make sense, but Jesus believes in me and he believes in you. This hot-tempered, inconsistent, confused and frustrated follower, Peter. And this is amazing news for all of us, those of us that have ever failed, ever quit, ever deserted, ever hidden who we actually are and what we're really about. Jesus, in his grace, believes in you. And he has a plan for you. He died for you to know ultimate forgiveness. And he rose again and ushered in his Holy Spirit as he left this earth to be in heaven. And so we can be in his presence in a tangible sense. And Jesus wants your heart. Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? Because he wanted Peter to know that I care more about this relationship than I do your behaviour modification. He didn't ask him the question, Peter, did you learn your lesson? Peter, do you promise not to do it again? Are you sure you've got the message now, Peter? He said, Peter, do you love me? You see, what Jesus wants most from us all is our hearts. And Peter, as he gives his heart to Jesus again, he makes a U-turn on the beach. He makes a U-turn on the beach with a cooked breakfast over a charcoal fire. Grace tastes like a cooked breakfast on the beach over a charcoal fire with Jesus. Jesus understood friendship in a way that Peter never imagined. Peter gave up on Jesus, but Jesus never gave up on Peter. And he doesn't give up on you today, no matter how far gone you may feel you are. I don't know about you, but when I think about friendship, I always think, what can I get from this? Are they nice to me? Have they taken me out for a coffee? Have they remembered my birthday? Do they give me the things that I really want in this relationship? Jesus demonstrates friendship no matter what. Jesus demonstrates friendship amongst rejection and hurt. I wonder whether for you, maybe today, there's a friendship you need to see restored. Somebody that you've angered or you've upset and you've never dealt with it. Maybe you need to go back and say, sorry. Maybe you need to go back and see that restored. Perhaps this is your moment for a U-turn in a relationship. Maybe the question, God, is there anything in my past that you want me to go back to and make right would be the best thing you could say today. For us all, whether we know Jesus personally or not, I want you to know that he's pursuing you. And he wants a relationship with you. He offers friendship for you today, no matter what you've done. And he has a plan for your life because he believes in you. And here's what I want you to know today. His grace is sufficient. No matter how far you've gone, no matter how far you've wandered away, no matter how many vows you've made that you've broken, no matter how many commitments you've made that you've fallen short of, no matter how many times you've said, God, I'll never do that again. And you've done that again. You're never too far gone. Perhaps we need to ask the question to Jesus today, is there anywhere where I continue to resist you? Is there anywhere where you need me to make a U-turn in my life? Because the reality is, we're never more than a prayer away of being made right with God. We're never more than an encounter away than being made right with God. It's such a beautiful thing to have that kind of grace. This grace is free. But as Peter knew, it's costly. It cost Jesus dearly and it cost Peter dearly as well. Jesus laid down his life so that we could know that kind of restoration. And it cost Peter who ultimately followed Jesus and he led the church in the power of the Holy Spirit ushering in the spirit and teaching and showing God's power through miracles and leading the church as the rock that he was once seen to be and always will be remembered for, just as Jesus had always believed he would be. Today, maybe there's an opportunity for us all to have a charcoal fire moment, 
Maybe you've wandered off. Maybe you've gone further afield than you ever thought you would. Gone back to an old way of living. Gone to a default way of living. Back to old habits. Chosen maybe even to count yourself out. But God's brought you within an earshot of this message today so that you would know that you're never more than a prayer away from restoration. Peter had no idea what would happen on the other side of that charcoal fire. He had no idea what God would do to his life, but I love how Jesus ends the conversation. He ends the conversation with, follow me. That was the first and very nearly the last thing that Jesus said to Peter. Those were the first and nearly the last words that Peter ever heard from Jesus. Why? Because Jesus wanted Peter to know it was all about relationship. That he believed in him and he had a plan for him. And it, it was to let Jesus lead his life. That Peter had to recognise he had to be obedient to the calling that Jesus had given him. And do you know how much freedom there is when we follow Jesus and we get rid of the stuff that we've been holding on to and that we deal with the stuff that we need to deal with with him at the centre of that process. When we make those U-turns, he reroutes us and changes the direction of our lives. Sometimes, in order to move forward, we have to go backwards. Sometimes, in life, we have to take the U-turn. Amen.